presenting, so just consider the people around you. And um, those of you, most of you have discovered that you can be wired up in here, so you've got outlets under the table. If you didn't bring your laptops today, feel free to for the rest of the sessions if you have them with you uh, here on this on this trip. You're welcome to do that. And uh, from time to time, we'll supply some uh, old-fashioned paper and pen notes, too, and we'll, we'll help you out with that. Please remember the wiki site, the Coach Wiki site, and we're going to save all the rest of any announcements until after. Y'all didn't do anything when I said that. Until after, <laughs> until after this session, and this session will be immediately followed by our National Student Leader Council panel. So please hang on for that. That is really special. We'll take just a few minutes of a turnaround there, uh, but not a lot, and then we'll go and have a long celebration lunch today. So uh, if you have a need to just slip out and back, we understand that, but we're just going to go right straight on through so we can pack it all in. So this morning's guest speaker is Dr. Jay Gary. He is here on faculty uh, of the School of Global Leadership and Entrepreneurship. He teaches courses in both the master's and the doctoral level programs. I've been privileged to have him for a professor now for the second time. And um, I will save all of those stories. I would ask you to be very nice to him because I don't have my grades yet. So, uh, but, um, but I have learned a tremendous amount from him. How many of you were here last year? So you got to hear from Dr. Gary. So maybe not quite half. So, uh, so they're new to you, and you can uh, bring us along a little bit. Dr. Gary is a student of the future and an instructor to help others study the future. And I'm going to leave it at that and let you get to know him yourself. But I certainly have appreciated him, and I hope you'll give him a warm welcome and a big listen and appreciate what he has to share with us as a Christian looking at the future. All right. I'm glad you've been warmed up for two or three days. You've, you've talked a lot about the how and seen it work as coaches. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you sort of the, the why and, and how do we become better coach, coaches through shaping the future. The slides I'm using online today are up here online, so you don't have to write like mad. But if you were to write that down, jgary.com, iccshaping.pdf, you could backtrack and do a remix and see what I'm doing today, all right? Um, it's fantastic to be with you about uh, today because I've been part of your community vicariously. I've uh, eaten lunch and dined recently with the amazing Wendell Moon. I've done all kind of wonderful things uh, this past uh, year, staying in touch with Teresa. And so today I wanted to talk about shaping the future because I understand that you've recently expressed your mission vision statement differently uh, or upgraded it to shaping the future through authentic leadership and cultural communication. So I'd like to talk about those two facets, the leadership of Jesus and how do we today shape our culture for a new renaissance, right? Two, two focus. I'm going to lean more on Jesus, probably one third on the new renaissance today, more on then, less on now, but I hope in the process you'll get a feel for what does it mean to uh, shape the future. Uh, again, welcome to Regent, Christian Leadership to Change the World. I teach on a faculty and enjoy it. Been here for four years. Spent in Colorado Springs, most uh, half of my work life before that, California. Uh, my wife sends greetings. Obi, she was with us last year, but uh, stopped off at the office this morning, didn't make it over. So, uh, Regent's going through a wonderful time of growth. And uh, this past week, I was at a meeting of uh, Virginia Beach, uh, considering the next 50 years of the area right around Regent. How do we shape the future of Regent? by shaping its environment. And the uh, region is only built out about this much. The university, once fully built, will go this much, so it's half built out. But we're talking about how to create uh, the future and shape it through a massive uh, public park here. Uh, and this is most undeveloped land, the last strategic growth area at Virginia Beach. And I was lobbying them to help turn region into a center for the creative and molecular economy for the 21st century and how to do that through innovation and incubators and all the rest. So Regents, uh, on a new day in 30 years we'll, or less, we'll have a light rail come down, stop right here. There'll be a university village below the campus. There'll be a new corporate uh, centers here. A lot of uh, village town centers of Centerville itself will revitalize the south. This will be the north of Centerville. So 
I live right here, so I bike and walk over. So I'm making sure uh, I protect my interest in shaping the future. So. <laughs> All right. Like I said, it was great to be with you last year. Uh, and the question is, we shape the future by shaping the next generation, right? We shape the future by shaping you. And last year, I spent a lot of time talking about the next 10 years, the next 15 years. I gave you three forecasts related to the next 10 years, what I see out there and how we need to adapt. One, digital natives will create a very different world. How many were born before 1964? How many are under 30 years old? <laughs> None of us. You're all, of course, digital uh, immigrants. Those out there are digital natives. Those digital natives, as you know, will create a whole different world. They know how the world works, uh, and they're reorganizing the world digitally. But by 2021, a majority of these digital natives, uh, an increase of over a billion, will be hungry, hopeless, and, and uh, yet they'll be connected in the third world. So the youth bulge that we experienced in the 60s and 70s is over to the third world. What are the implications of that? Reciprocally based uh, innovation in the cloud, cloud could be the biggest opportunity in history. The, a new generation working together, community together, solving problems together be the biggest opportunity ever that we've seen and will recreate the 21st century. Now that's uh, that's the next 10 years. I told you today I'm going to go back to Jesus and then talk about you know yesterday, today, that's tomorrow. But, but ICC looks to tomorrow. And when ICC looks to tomorrow, you have to say, where are we going today and where could we be in a decade? And what are we doing in terms of uh, concentration in current products and markets? I teach MBA sometimes, so I get up things like this. Uh, and then where are we going with new products to the same market? Where are we going with new markets uh, and diversification? And I can tell you, I see very few organizations that have the potential and the, dyna the, dyna the dynamism that you do to help recreate the world all over again. Uh, and that's what we need today. We need to move out, and we need to reach the bottom half, uh, the base of the pyramid. And, and you can see my slides uh, last year. ICCforecast.pdf at jgary.com. ICCforecast.pdf. All right, so yes, you must. You can. It's before you. It's within your grasp. Uh, you can shape the future as an emerging movement of youth and an intergenerational movement and a multicultural movement. Uh, I often think about other times and people of Issachar you've heard in uh, ancient times where people that tried to see a new day, tried to feel which way the weather was going. They went with David rather than Saul. And they were known as people who saw the times, understood the times, and knew what Israel should do. We need to, uh, we need to aspire to that, but yet, We've been interrupted, right, by the Great Recession. I was this morning listening to talk about uh, austerity and stimulus, elections, uh, Greece, Europe. Uh, we've been in a great recession of our time, the greatest of our lifetime. We, we're in a slow recovery. Are we going to go to a double dip, or will we, will we bottom? Are we bottomed out? What do we do uh, when there's a great recession? How do we? tap into great reserves. So what I'm talking about today is how you develop the capacity to reframe all things through Christ, all right? Reframe all things from the inside out rather than the outside in. And how do we tap into those great uh, reserves? Now, that doesn't, that, that doesn't mean that the climate is, uh, is ready. To, uh, we, we are almost at an end of an age thinking. Uh, the decline of the West, the end of America, uh, that's the, the thinking, post-American world, politically, or collapse uh, geopolitically. These are books the last decade. Uh, this past uh, couple of months, I read Freeman's That Used to Be Us, How America Fell Behind in the World. Uh, it invented how it could come back. So are we at the end of an age or a transition to a, a post-normal world, a 2% growth, a static? Or are we at the beginning of something new? I believe we're at the beginning of a, of a, of a time beyond the modern age, a molecular age, a new way of cooperating, a new way of working together. But it's, it's a painful transition, but we need to move through it, and we need to embrace it. And, uh, but yet, uh, end of an age thinking is, has consumed us. 
apocalyptic thinking has consumed us. I, uh, my wife and I have been married 34 years, and uh, so this year I took her on her 25th uh, wedding anniversary cruise. <laughs> I've been promising this for seven years, and she always says, no, not this year, next year, not this year, next year. So we went down uh, the Caribbean Western, I guess it was, sailed uh, down to Belize, and all you've been there or done that. But I, I remember climbing up the top of this uh, Mayan temple, Altunha in Belize, and it's actually that steep and tall. Uh, we climbed up the back end. They, they had rails going up, no rails going down. Uh, but this was an entire culture that came to an end. They were built on violence, uh, sacrifice. Uh, this was a jade center of trading and, and, and ritual. Uh, they were a 5,000 person community around here. I came back and watched Apocalypto again to, to think about, you know, mind calendar 2012, what are we thinking and all that. And uh, how do we move beyond that? And, um, but it was, it was a lot of fun. And it, it got me thinking about uh, the end of the world. Now, I'm going to talk to you here about uh, keep on dance until the world. And this is, you could call this the second coming of Britney Spears or, uh, or the gospel according to Britney. But Britney's interesting, and she is a voice of our generation, even though she can't keep it, uh, hold the judgeship down on the X Factor very well. But uh, let me play you a little clip from Britney, and then I want to ask you to ask yourselves while you're watching it, what am I seeing? What is Britney, what is her generation singing about? What does it mean to dance till the end of the world? And, uh, and how do they think about the adult world, and how do they think beyond the adult world, all right? Now, I know uh, it's, it's a little sizzle in this as well as the uh, steak. We're going to try to get down to the steak, but uh, th there's a good beat here, so you can stand up and, uh, and uh, have some fun if you want. Dance over and get some coffee. Right. right. We're, but, we're uh, the over 30 bunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, December 21st, 2012. Yeah, let's try it again here and turn up the volume. This is Tim, but you don't try not to see. Spit it out, cause I'm dying for company. Go to the underground club here. I notice that you got it, you notice that I want it, you know that I can take it to the next level, baby. If you want this good bitch, sicker than the remix, baby, let me blow your mind tonight. I can't take it, take it, take no more. Never felt like, felt like this before. Come on, get me, get me on the floor. DJ, what you, what you waiting for? Oh. According to Brittany, and what is there a redemptive message here? Uh, I uh, had the advantage of looking at the lyrics, but uh, I can't take it, take it no more. Never felt like this before. Come on, get me on the floor, DJ. What are you waiting for? Maybe Brittany's calling out for the DJ's the world of player music, but more likely there's a 
let's keep dancing, go to the underground club and have a good time tonight type of message you know, over here. But uh, look at this. At the end, what did you see? The sun comes out, right? And what happens? It emerges, and uh, maybe Brittany sees her star still rising. It's not falling. You know, whatever. You can read this at all different levels. But the uh, see the sunlight wane, stop and keep on dancing till the world ends. If you feel it, let it happen. Keep on dancing till the world ends. Does she believe the world's ending? Her experience disconfirms that the world's beginning. So she keeps on dancing till the world begins. And that's what this culture is looking for. They're looking for a way to dance through the systemic collapses and, and remakes and, and recreations of, of, of the adult world. They're wanting to dance through it, and they're wanting to survive it. They want to go beyond the end. And that's the message of this generation. We sang, you know, let it be and all those type of things when I was growing up. But uh, they, they want to keep on dancing. Um, now, there's been times of trouble between different ages, and we're living in a time of transition. Here's three different uh, ages, the classical age, medieval age, the modern age, and we're about here. Remember here, this was uh, you know, the fall of Rome here, and uh, time of trouble. We call this the dark ages, and more enlightened ways to talk about that now. Uh, here's the 100 years war between, uh, in Europe at, at the dawn of the Reformation and, and what that entailed. And here we have the World War I, World War II, and the trouble and the transition from the modern age to a, perhaps a global age, more organic age, molecular age, or, or who knows what. But the point here is that what we often label as the end of the world may be only the end of a modern age. And our kids are, want to live for tomorrow. They want to live for a new day. And they want to dance until the world begins for them. I'm really uh, happy my daughter just got an internship in DC, uh, just earned her master's in communication, and she's down at Pal Tate, a top PR company, and she's calling me and my wife every day, giving us updates on what she's doing. And, uh, but it's amazing to see her, tr her transformation. She, did, she studied communications public policy. She's working at a PR firm, advertising agency. And so it's amazing to see her transformation. My son, too, went to Iraq, came home, is going to school now, but he's thinking about physics. He goes, I'm going to teach physics or I'm going to uh, be a physicist, you know? So, um, and this is what, uh, so what Augustine said this during this time of trial, we can take the same words of his. He said, Christ came when all things were growing old and made them new. Christ came when all things were growing old. Uh, Anita and your name? Jim. Jim. Anita and Jim are from Colorado Springs. You've been up Pikes Peak, right, on the train. Uh, there's a tree like this going up the train, right up at the tree line. It's 2,000 years old. And notice the growth here, you know, still springing out. Christ came when all things were growing old, Augustine said, but he made them new. And so that's the type of thinking we have, need to have in terms of shaping the future. I was fortunate enough in my career to get alongside a lot of uh, what I call Christian futurists that thought beyond the end, that thought beyond the group thing, that thought beyond and thought about the innovative culture, the creative culture. And uh, here's uh, David Barrett and Todd Johnson talking about different uh, horizons before us, the immediate future, near future, middle range, long range, 100 years, distant future, 1,000, far distant future, 1,000 years out and beyond. But you don't normally hear uh, talk about that. So I, I gave a lot of my life to start thinking and acting to shape the future. When I was in my 30s, I started a program called Perspectives, and it totally renovated the study program and the way World Mission interacts with the future and a new generation. Later, I worked and got involved, attracted, and helped launch a program called AD 2000 and Beyond. It was in the 80s, and it helped bring new innovations into world mission leaders around the world. In the 90s, I started focusing on Beyond 2000, and what 2000 meant to us as a, as a society and civilization because of Jesus' birthday, but also in uh, Times Square. Tomorrow night I'm meeting with three young guys that want to think about 2033 and what the 2000th anniversary of the birth of the church is. And they're from France and others. So I'm, I've always leveraged forward because I know that I, I don't put as much importance in myself with the next generation. I need to give to, to them that. And we need to think uh, long run, not short run. A colleague of mine... Uh, started uh, doing writing, and I've done a lot of workshops with him on the next five industries. We've had the last four, 
agriculture, industrial information, or services information. That's the big four. Here's the big five coming up, leisure, life sciences, mega materials, atomic age, new space age. In other words, we can think forward. Yet we need investments today. We need, we need to restart the world. We need a reset. And it's going to come from people that uh, believe in the future and believe in God to help bring about a new day. So in our time today, I've gave, uh, passed a card out to you. Uh, and I'm asking you to give me some comments as we're going through. Particularly, I'll give you a, a time at the about uh, halfway through to give me some comments. We'll chat about them. But I'm going to first reflect on how Jesus reshaped his generation to see the future. And then second, I'm going to consider how we can shape ourselves for a new renaissance. In between, we'll have some discussion. Uh, I'll put you in some discussion. And then uh, I'll get into the section. We'll do some larger discussion. So with that... Uh, buckle your seats. We're going to talk about uh, the future according to Jesus and then talk about our role in shaping the future of culture and, and what does that mean in our world today. So I, I approach this a very grounded way and I ask the question not from theology above but from history below. And I talk about Jesus in ways that you may have never heard and that's fine. But I, I, I do it purposely to give you a different perspective a bottom-up perspective rather than a top-down. And so my question is, how can a Galilean Jew teach us about shaping the future? How did he shape his future of his generation? And how is his dynamics, not just his doctrine, uh, something that we can follow? So what was the crisis facing Jesus? Uh, this is a wonderful picture when you think about uh, the obvious and overstating it and, and things that are hidden. and. Uh, if you walk in this room, what would you talk to this woman about? What she's reading, the paintings on the wall, the wallpaper, oh, the elephant. Uh, what was the elephant in the room of Jesus and his and the first century? What was the crisis they were facing? How did he relate to that? Can you name it? Roman rule. Roman rule. Excellent, excellent. It's getting uh, very, very good. Excellent. Roman rule. Empire. It's called empire. Changes uh, in the economy. Yeah. What else? Yeah. Well, you had the um, the religious <laughs> leaders that were trying to set the pace, but really not caring in a sense that the others yeah. came with. Corrupt them, leadership. Yeah. Versus yeah. the tax gatherers and sinners, okay. and you had these two groups of okay. people: aristocracy and and uh, working poor and peasants. And Jesus was a Galilean working for him. Uh, I, I express it this way, and it's a clash between those things. I talk about the Christ of Jesus' day that was looming was a conflict that he saw come. Now, retrospect, we look back on this. He was prospect looking forward to it. Now, it was, it was not a, a utopia. It was a nightmare, you know, in his, his time. He was wanting to live, dance until the world re-began re re again. And so he was teaching people how to move through that in. Now, it's funny, uh, Roman-Jewish war had happened uh, in August, September. In Christianity, we have two major holidays. What are they? Christmas, Christmas and Easter, right? We don't celebrate this. The Jews mourn this in <laughs> the collapse of the temple and the end of their, you know, the tribal uh, culture and their, their nation state in, in, in August, regularly. But this was a major traumatic event. Uh, two million people were displaced or, uh, or put into bondage or servitude. Uh, and the Jews all over the world were disrupted. Uh, uh, and about 100,000 died through crucifixion. Uh, this was a major traumatic event of wiping out of, uh, of their land, their temple, their uh, ruling authorities. They had had independence for 100 years. And so in thinking about this shaping the future, I wanted to share with you a model I've been playing with about how Jesus shaped his terrain ahead of him, all right? Now, I'm bracketing this here 100 years, 175 years before Jesus, maybe 100 years after him. So I'm not talking about today, I'm talking about then, all right? But the model may help you think forward today, but it's really applied to him. And I'll draw some lessons out to it. But Basically, it goes like this. A blue line is here, and the only way you go into the future is the conventional path. 
But along the conventional path, there's a rocky road of opposition, the loyal opposition, the counter future, the counter path. Uh, those, uh, those that are accommodating to Rome and those that are opposing Rome uh, begin a civil war and end in a breakdown, if that would have happened. And Jesus stood here looking forward, and it did happen. Uh, but there was a second chance. But before we get to that point of, of uh, the clash between modernism and fundamentalism, there's a way to create a new future. Uh, and so let me rehearse it this way again. So we enter the future, and there's trouble on the lower line. But we could take an upper line path. And on that upper line path, we can make all things new and hit breakthrough rather than break down. Right? So in this sense, uh, even though this is a systems model of my thinking, Jesus didn't draw this in the sand, I'm trying to capture some logic uh, in the way in which he approached his time. Uh, let's talk about this blue line, conventional, future. What was happening in Main Street in Jesus' time? He had uh, 300 years of Greek culture, the push of the past. He had 150 years of Roman rule, the push of politics. He had 1,500 years of Moses, the push of tradition. It was all legitimized in what we call Sadducees, right? And, and the aristocracy and the temple priests and all that. That's the blue line, the conventional line. There was the push uh, back uh, to the conventional future of Main Street, on Side Street, the side stream. Those are the Pharisees, the Essenes, and others. Uh, but Jesus, at some point here, uh, leaves his carpenter bench, stone masonry work, and says, repent for the time, the kingdom of God is at hand. What are you saying? He's saying that change your mind because God's changing the times. God's changing the times from breakdown to breakthrough. We don't have to break through. We can die to ourselves and rise again as a culture to a new day and a new humanity. He called forth a vanguard to, to walk through that suffering. And we talk about Jesus being a bridge over troubled water. He was for that generation. And he and it literally recreated the world from the inside out through metaphor, through communication, through story. Now, there were divine contingencies and interventions and theology and all what you've ever learned about Jesus. And I'm really I'm talking really about the impact of the first coming here, not the second coming, all right? I'm talking about the enduring historical impact after the cross. This first question marks the cross. This second question mark is the Roman Jewish civil war civil war among the Jews and the collapse of, of this 15, 800 years tradition of Moses and, uh, and the rebirth of that uh, through the church here and rabbinic Judaism in terms of moving forward, recreating the temple from the inside out. So let me, uh, let me unpack this a little bit with you. And uh, first, conventional. So we're looking at the blue line, all right? It's always business as usual. It's official futures. The main story. It's the top down. It's what you read in the Wall Street Times, the Wall Street Journal, uh, maybe the New York Times, the culture and business. Uh, for Jesus, there was disruptors going on throughout uh, the Holy Land. Disruptors are reshaping the way he lived and the way uh, Galilean peasants lived and worked. And, and they were losing tradition. They were losing uh, family. I'm going to take you to Caesarea Sephora and Jerusalem and talking about these disruptors. Caesarea was a port city, you can see here, Tel Aviv here today. And note here, uh, big harbor, out here was a big man-made harbor. This city had been totally transformed by Herod the Great, you've heard of him and the Magi, right? Uh, Ten years before Jesus was born. A great amphitheater, you can see this uh, hippodrome here. Huge temple to the goddess Roma. Uh, Herod had no thoughts about doing another temple over in Jerusalem, you know, to Yahweh. Uh, military occupation. But the real story here was economy. This was the port city linking Palestine to the empire. And it was causing massive dislocation and change of markets in the countryside outside the fortress here of uh, Caesarea. So Caesarea was on the coast. We don't ever have Jesus regularly visiting there, but the implications came to him when his son... Herod's son, Antipas, took the same methods of, of uh, occupation and commercialization and brought them to force. This is a city that's just been excavated 50, 60 years ago in 47, but it, we now realize today it was the major commercial centers, not mentioned the Gospels, only metaphorically through Jesus' parables. 
but it's it's no doubt he spent extensive time there and his father likely spent time there working building some of the things you see here uh, and notice Roman villas where uh, Caesarea was uh, a Roman Sephora was all Jewish it was all all kosher but it was very Romanized and it was very uh, Greek Hellenized in an extreme way but Antipas followed the same pattern of collecting taxes handing out patient estates disrupting the local economy, uh, sending people, village peasants, into monocropping, sharecropping, and, and really creating an unrest and a cultural revolt below. And it was, uh, he established markets, you can see market patterns. You didn't see like this in Nazareth, just four miles away. You would never have seen these kind of streets. Uh, a Roman market uh, in 20 AD here, visualized. Uh, so commercialization, and the world had come to Jesus through uh, not just Romanization or occupation, but commercialization. Urbanization, Jerusalem was became a world-class city for tourism and pilgrimage and worship. There's the temple here. Priestly mansions, 3,600 square feet mansion here. They're living high on the hog, metaphorically high on the cow, you know, not the hog. Uh, it was uh, a, 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 a quite a despair. They built a special bridge to get here so they didn't have to walk among lonely folks and, uh, and also control the temple system. Uh, so when Jesus comes proclaiming, repent, the kingdom of God has a hand, Croson says that Jesus was uh, preaching. His audience would have understood him as, as relief against the intensive Romanization, urbanization, and culturalization that entered the Jewish homeland through Caesarea. There was relief at last on the horizon. Uh, Jesus, what did he think about the conventional future? Well, he was a prophet, and he, he prophesied that official future and its temple would not have a stone left upon another within his generation. And we remember him today because he was right, looking back. And we remember him because he helped prepare people to go beyond, the people of God, Jew and Gentile. And so he, in a sense, uh, stand in judgment on the lower line and called people to this upper line in, in human history. Uh, I remember standing in this place. It's a burnt house and spear of a lady. Her bones were found walking up the stairs. But these were some uh, family members of these priests. But the entire world uh, was burned and went up in flames in 70 AD in summer. So the conventional and counter future clashed and that world broke down. Let's talk about the counter briefly. The counter future is always a rocky road. We must intervene, you know, the bottom up revolt. Uh, uh, see this picture? These little fish have a problem, right? Uh, they need leadership. They're not getting it, right? And what's the problem? The big fish is eating the little fish. Think Assad, Syria, think you know Egypt. Tables turned over bark. Here they turn the tables. They organize. Either, either you're scattered or you're organized. And so Jesus was trying to reorganize this society. Little fish coordinating to chase away the big fish, all right? And uh, there were people that were his co contemporaries in different movements, Essenes, Pharisees, Zealots. But he carved out a special space to uh, reorganize and, re and search for covenant renewal. And it was over and against the prevailing regime. He did it. But he was a dissident. Uh, and he was nonviolent, but he was a dissident. But he's the only one that showed a way beyond. And remember him today for doing that. So resistance took two forms in his day, fight or flight. Flight means go out to the desert, wait for the end. That Qumran did that 150 years before Jesus. Fight was the end of the Jewish state. Masada did that. Both failed. The counter-futures both failed in Jesus' day, as he saw. Let's talk about Qumran, or Pharisees came from Qumran in terms of the pious ones. Uh, the Qumran folks stayed by the Dead Sea Desert, but the Pharisees were a lay movement, a renewal, doing the same thing, trying to anticipate piety to think the end would come. Well, the end did come for their generation, but it, uh, it turned out an oh, end of uh, not just flight, but but fighting the Romans, and it didn't end up well. Uh, but a lot of the counter-future were people that dis, that were scattered out of the uh, hinterlands to, and uh, became bandits, prophets, and messiahs. So this was the culture Jesus was identified with, and Herod made his reputation by actually rooting them out and bringing them under control. So Qumran could be... Uh, uh, Flight into the desert, their end time community. They were very much, we learn a lot about them, the Dead Sea Scrolls. They uh, bathed themselves daily for dinner. They they copied the scriptures. Uh, 
And they waited for the new covenant. They were new covenant people in that regard. Uh, but they were exclusivists. They didn't believe in, in including others that were Gentiles. Uh, but they did believe that a 40-year war would start with righteous warriors, sons of light against sons of darkness. And metaphorically, that did happen after the cross, a 40-year war, a battle. Uh, and it ended up uh, like the Branch Davidians of not a very good term. So Masada, a fortress, uh, and these were freedom fighters, but at the same time, they were assassins. And those in Jesus' day didn't see them very highly. They've been romanticized in our day by Israel, but it was the end of the Jewish state. So the outcome, Jesus didn't think very highly of zealots or people like Masada. Faith for Jesus didn't mean a repeat of the Maccabean miracle of independence before him. It meant suffering through to the end and beyond, dancing to the world began. Causes led by zealots would lead to a collision of Rome and the collapse of the nation. He warned against extremism and Jewish nationalism and, and, and hate and anger. So the, let's talk about the uh, creative path. There's a better way beyond fight or flight. Jesus offered a third way, faith. Uh, he grew up in the shadow of Sephora's. You know, how did he think about creatively shaping the future? Well, he grew up in the shadow of Sephora's that had been burned to the ground in 4 BC uh, due to revolt. It was, uh, imagine him growing up uh, around campfires, hearing about extended relatives that had died in, in the fire of Sephora's. Not only was there a fire, but Sephora's, they put a thousand people, they said, on, on crosses from Sephora's, 4 BC. And so it was very traumatic that the area that Jesus grew up in related to revolt and related to the cost of it. And he understood this cost. And so in a sense, he saw himself, if one person could die, the whole nation wouldn't have to. He saw himself dramatizing the bitter end that they were about to experience to save them from that end. The cross to him was taking upon himself uh, this rage, this hate of Rome, this hate of each other, and dying to it to release people from the powers of the of the lower line future to rise to the upper line future. Right? I'm talking like a sociologist, but we need to think about shaping the future in public terms, not just private terms. All right? So Jesus would take upon himself this. He would experience what Sephora had experienced. He would try to take it in a sting away from the powers of the day and move toward a, a, a first fruits world or where will people be regathered and gathered into a harvest to, to prove the, the power and the, and the full restoration of Israel and humanity at that point. And so he wanted to break a cycle of violence, of oppression and dissident violence, and his new way would do that. He asked those who followed him to be spared from the carnage of the Great War. He promised they'd be spared. He said, get out of Jerusalem when you see it coming. Uh, they would raise up and vindicate him, form a, half, a new nucleus in the house of Israel. So um, you can see here, uh, in a sense, three phases of Jesus' plan to shape the future. Uh, first, antebellum, before the war, before the conflict, he calls forth the people to survive, to dance until the world begins here, uh, back past 70. Second, to the bellum. This is what we call the apostolic age, but it's always a time of transition. Like we're living in a time of transition between eras. It's a time of rude beginnings. It's a time of emergence. We don't know what's ending and what's beginning sometimes, but that's when you need apostolic leadership. You need innovative leadership. You need authentic leadership. And then three, reconstruction. Jesus had a vision for that. Uh, he didn't say a lot about this, uh, but he did uh, talk about uh, dining in the kingdom, and he thought the kingdom historically, in other words, redemption would enter in history, not just beyond history, that the, the people of God would have continuity. And, uh, and because he acted and saved us from our worst selves, we can rise today for the new humanity, and, and, and we can join uh, him and follow him in recreating the world, particularly when we need to do it, uh, when we face all of our ends in that way. So. All right, here's the takeaway for you today. Uh, what, how do you shape the future? How did Jesus shape the future? First, don't take the official future as given. All right? Second, ruthlessly, not the official future of government, of business, and the church, where we've entered a post-Christendom age. 
Christendom, long live Christendom, <laughs> it's dead, you know? Long live Christ. You know, we, we're not a post-Christian age, but we're post-Christendom. Don't take the official future as given what you hear. Ruthlessly critique alternatives. Uh, movements built on, on hate and fear. Intervene to transform the whole system and heal it. Jesus acted for all. He solved the problems of his day, the clash between Hellenism and Judaism. He solved it for all peoples in that day. Uh, so transform this. In. Embody change you want to see. All right? Embody the change. Live it. And then turn every end into a new beginning. The world was really recreated after Jesus and through him in his day. The rabbinics, I told you, Jews followed him only sociologically in the sense of recreating all the temple sacrifice and all their systems internally. In other words, Jesus was a makeover artist, all right? A reality show. He was a turnaround specialist. He turned things around. He transformed. He didn't just reform things. He recreated the world from the inside out, all right? So shaping the future, leadership, is the capacity to shift the inner place from which a system operates. Jesus shifted the inner place from which people stood. They didn't stand in the lower line. They were standing in the upper line the future and living for, from the new day, from the age beyond, and living from that power of the ages to come that fulfill the ancient promises. So. All right, I've talked a lot. Now I want to hear you talk to me. If you have a comment or question, why don't you write it down here? I'm going to give you about two minutes to work on these cards, and then I'll tell you what to do next. So if you have a comment, say one, give a comment. If you have a question, Put number two, question, and we'll talk about this in a little bit. Could you put back up your five action points there? Yeah. Great, thank you. Society and how would you apply that? So go ahead and turn to a neighbor. If you're done with the cards, you can pass them this way, and uh, we'll I'll comment on them in a, in a little bit here. And I'll give you a couple moments just to chat among yourselves as you change gears this the Bible says this only or that it doesn't come through that it's going to come through bottom up and inside out it's going to come through living it not not through just preaching are you saying Jesus main purpose to change the immediate future regarding the Jews uh, yes his purpose the cross and the fall of Jerusalem changed the order the order of the ages it was the change from the old to the New Testament we talk about it theologically like that. But it was the change from this age, the age to come. The age to come has not only begun, there's been a maturation of the kingdom where the kingdom is here. It's through that power of change that all things can be made new. All sciences, all histories, all peoples, all conflicts. So Jesus changed things. Where do we intervene in the, to transform the system? Well, the opposite you know, where we can, we intervene. Uh, um, we intervene, we shape the system like we shape our, you know, our seasons. We, we do it incrementally. Uh, we, we, like we plant, we plant, I plant seed in the fall or we seed my garden, my, my uh, grass. We do it in small ways, but, but these smaller acts add up to a larger new culture, a new way. We revitalize the culture. What's been the influence of eschatology in the church's engagement in the future? Uh, it's been negative. Now, when I mean eschatology, I mean end times. Uh, single string on the violin thinking, all right? It's been negative. I often think that the eschatology has as much to do with the impact of the first coming, as I showed you here, as it does at the end of space-time history. In fact, I talk about eschatology only long enough to get people talking about the future of humanity and what God is doing in us and through us uh, because of what he did for us and where we need to move uh, tomorrow. So there's a lot of different views in eschatology, understand that, or millennialism. And, um, I put the accent on how Jesus faced his end in the last days of his generation rather than our last days because I don't see us written in the Bible. Uh, I don't see a script for our generation. I see scripture and I see a world without end before us. So there's always been a multiplicity of views I don't talk as much about eschatology as archonology, archonology, the beginning of all things made new and the beginning of the new covenant, not the old covenant, uh, the end of it. So what are some real life examples of your five action points? How do we keep the momentum going? Um, goodness, five action points. The real life examples, uh, you know, who are your heroes? Who, who, 
my, my hero was my father, who, who kept his head down and, and labored, part of the greatest generation, and provided me a lot. He, he lived so I might live more fully, uh, economically, uh, educationally, otherwise. He sacrificed for me. Those are the kind of investments that I want. And uh, those are the kind of things that uh, we need to do. So the real life example, let's say, you know, look around uh, your own life, and they're there, and uh, need to move forward. Let me take the last seven minutes or, or so and chat with you a bit about um, this second question. Uh, consider how we can shape ourselves for a new renaissance. If you take anything from what Jesus said, you know, it's the lesson of Pogo. The, we've seen the enemy. The enemy is us. Jesus was a critique from within of a society. He wasn't critiquing the Romans as much as he was critiquing his own people. And so we must be the change that we embody. We must be the change society needs. Now, when I say we, I'm not talking about identities from artifacts, you know, church buildings and things like that. Jesus moved the identity, and Paul particularly, from the flesh to the spirit. He transformed our identity from above and not below. From above meant the age to come and where future generations and the afterlife. He reassigned our identity to that. And so in looking at shaping the future, how can we shape ourselves for a new renaissance, for this time after the modern age? So let me ch chat with you about uh, a people who break all my rules and contradict everything I've ever said and uh, means that you don't have to listen to anything I've said today. This is, uh, I saw the Smithsonian had a special on about a, a month ago or less, the grammar of happiness about the Pirahad of Amazon. And they're uh, only about 250 people. They're, the, they, they're one of the happiest people in the world, but they have no concern for the distant past. They have no concern for the distant future. In fact, their grammar is such they don't have numbers. <coughs> And they don't, they don't have colors. Everything is, is suited for right where they are. In fact, it's called a big controversy in linguistics because they, they don't even speak in complex sentences. But their language, they can sing it. They can hum it. They're uniquely adapted to their context. They talk about everybody outside themselves as crooked heads, and they're straight heads. <laughs> and they're straight for their context. Uh, this fellow, a former missionary in the real sense because he's struggling with his faith now. But don't sleep, they're snakes. He talks about his experience, and um, and, I, and I, you're welcome to search for him and watch some YouTubes of him or the Smithsonian special. But the key thing that he's learned is that out of culture and communication between people comes language, and out of language then comes society, not the other way around. It doesn't come from genetics, although we're given the ability to speak and to vocalize, you know, through God-given ability. <coughs> But it's through culture comes language, and language comes technique and society and things. And so it's this, the, the immediacy of experience is what but, uh, uh, Everett says we can take away from the, from the uh, Pirahan. They don't tell stories. They tell stories about what they saw and what they're doing today and the implications for tomorrow, barely. But they've simplified everything to live in a very complex world, all right? And there's enough fish, so they don't need to think about tomorrow. Right? They don't need to send their kids to school. All right? um, it may not always be that way. In the medieval age, it was like that. Everything was united. You know, the, the king ruled and all these things. There was, the world was one. Uh, but in the modern age, we have differentiation between the left hand and the right hand. The left hand became distinct from the right hand. The right hand was the objective sphere or what was seen uh, from the subjective objective was distinguished, fact and value. What's interpreted was what was seen. In other words, the interiors became differentiated from the external. Now, this was a, the Enlightenment was a gift to humanity. It separated astrology from astronomy. And what has astronomy done for us? It's done a lot. You know, it reflected back on how we see ourselves and, and created, uh, open up space for the future for habitation. So it, it was a great gift. Uh, this differentiation, but it was also a negative consequence. Now let me pause here and just say uh, the modern age is a system. Unlike the Piraha, we have a lot of complexity to our lives. In other words, a lot of history lived. 
the Pirha, Everett said, uh, about talking about Jesus, he said, uh, how tall was he? And uh, was he brown or white? And he says, no, I, uh, Everett says, no, I didn't see him. He lived a long time ago. Why are you talking to us about him? You know, like, they're living immediate. But we have, we have, we have superstructure, structure, and infrastructure. Superstructure being culture, structure being society, family, and secondary structures, and infrastructure being nature and, 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 and economy in that regards. But there's a great deal of intensification, a great deal of diversification in these three, this pyramid, let's call it, and a great deal of, of uh, feedback. But what we're, what's happening in the modern world is not, needs to be critical, it needs to be criticized, but it needs to be built upon and transformed, not not burned down, right? Uh, we have intensification going on with the environment and its infrastructure. Uh, that's production, so the environment's at risk. We have reproduction going on population. Uh, primary structures, secondary structures. We put grandma in the retirement home now because the family can't sustain them. The wife's working at work. Uh, we used to have organic society, now it's, it's more mechanical. Uh, loss of human identity, but this culture needs to be renewed. We need to turn the pyramid upside down so it's cult culture, uh, society, and, uh, and nature uh, reintegrated together. So the modern age needs reshaping, but it needs intervention and love and compassion and human identity needs to be renewed. Things have been rationalized, and we need to re-invitalize and re-enchant uh, the modern world with, with true stories and true communication. And so what's become separated, the, the right-hand objective from the left-hand, has now become fragmented, political polarization. And institutions are looking out their own interests. Habermas said that the problem was you had these uh, intersubjective knowledge communities building knowledge in science and religion here, but they're looking out of their own interests and they're ignoring the emancipatory interests of people. Now, we needed to change that, reorganize right around people rather than uh, just objective knowledge and just special interests of the tribe. So both tribes and knowledge communities need to be reorganized and need to be renovated. And he was critiquing Marx, he's critiquing others in this um, Habermas is who I've been talking to. His theory of communicative action, I encourage you to think about if you're a reader, and you, the readers are leaders, so you are a leader and a reader. Uh, rationality meant a couple of worldviews, colonization of our life worlds by business and government, but individuals must act critically, loyalty to their institutions, to their families even, critical loyalty, and take up communicative action to renew people and culture. It's so vital, you know, uh, what we need to do in terms of creating a new communication, a new language of love, a new uh, uh, community of love. So what this means is that adults have work to do, not just the youth. Uh, here's a book I highly recommend to you, In Over Our Heads, and this is an intelligible book, not like me talking. This is really intelligible, okay? Uh, you say, well, I feel like a, a C student in a, a room of Alec Jordan's. Well, <laughs> I struggle with what I say sometimes, all right? <laughs> but I, uh, half, of what, uh, half of what I know I, is good, the other half I don't. It's just, you know, I don't know which part, you know? But uh, we're all works in progress. But here's the story of, of uh, adults and authentic leadership and moral development. We move from conventional and traditional sense joining society in our 30s to uh, self-authorship, having our own mind, having our own views, having our own work, uh, to self-transforming minds. In other words, our very way of organizing transforms. The Piedraha live in a single world. They don't have to transform their mind. They're socialized from the point of view of nine years old. They can stand alone. Uh, but we need to continue to transform minds morally and spiritually. Now, this is the trajectory of spiritual maturity. But the church, for the most part, is centered right here. They're not centered in the new culture, a, a moral culture that's that's uh, that's meta or systemic or problem fine or interdependent in terms of collaboration. Inter and so these are three different cultures, about 50 percent, 30 percent, probably 7 percent. These are a study done in business. But uh, we need to cross the Jabbok like Jacob of old. And, uh, 
uh, begin a new day. And I encourage you in this uh, regard. So, And to see self-transformation at work, uh, be, to recreate ourselves, to, uh, more to say, I'll let you read the slides on that, to invent our own work rather than see it owned by the boss. But very transformations we need to do in our 40s and even 50s. Our kids need to be socialized. We need to be more into freedom and, and mutually authored. They need to be more group authored. And there are two different life stages, and it's a potential conflict now between adults and youth in this regard in terms of the inner lives and the inner ways of organizing. But Jesus showed us the way to recreate our worlds from the inside out, and Paul showed us that we can do it uh, in terms of transformation. So the message to you in, in closing is that uh, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and, or write. It will be those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn again. I'm calling you today to, to learn, unlearn everything you've known about Jesus, and then relearn everything you can about the new world of the digital natives so you can be a coach to them 30, 60, 100-fold and bring forth the movements of tomorrow to create the new Renaissance culture. Thank you very much. Good to be with you.